am going to turn this over to our first presentation today. Um, you have already met Ted Hartwell, and he teased you yesterday with the fact that you're going to learn a whole lot more about this issue of video games and video gaming addiction and all of our young people and old people um, who get involved in gambling through those means. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I'll wait till we get back to check the feedback here. I, I use this uh, little sound effects device, a lot of presentations with the, with the uh, kids, but it works with the adults too, and so I've started using it at, at all of them. You may, you may hear one or two more before we finish up. Um, uh, for those of you that didn't meet me yesterday, my name is Ted Hartwell. I am the Community Engagement Liaison for the Nevada Council on uh, Problem Gambling, and uh, uh, one Carol O'Hare took me under her wing when I appeared at this state conference about a decade or so ago early in my own recovery from a gambling disorder and just wanting to uh, learn more about this illness that had afflicted me, see if there were opportunities uh, for me to um, get involved in public awareness and, and, and advocacy on, on this issue. And she has been a, a mentor for me over this past decade and today I administer a lot of the uh, community awareness uh, programs that the council has and I've developed a couple since I've been with the council one focused on student athlete gambling awareness, a very important issue that we alluded to uh, yesterday, and also the, um, uh, the impact of the games we play. My presentation this morning is named for the video game awareness uh, program that I administer here in the Clark County School District through the FACES program, which is an extracurricular program where schools can uh, request the presentation, and it is designed for um, both parents and or students in any combination. I've got a few slides that I add or subtract depending on what my audience is going to be, but we essentially cover the same, uh, same material because we, we certainly want um, uh, everyone across the spectrum to get an education, ed education about some of the uh, concerning features of certain uh, video games in general and the possibility that, that uh, video games, uh, digital gaming, can develop into a true addictive uh, disorder just as gambling uh, disorder I can. Um, a little bit about my own background. I, I didn't mention a lot of the other hats that I wear yesterday, but I'm about half time for the council. The other half of the time, I'm a research scientist with the Desert Research Institute, which is the nonprofit research arm of the Nevada System of Higher Education. Um, it came here to Nevada in 1991. My background, my degrees are in anthropology with an emphasis in archaeology. So for the first 10 years or so of my career with DRI, I was an archaeologist working out on the Nevada test site where this nation tested nuclear weapons for several decades, and that transitioned into a role managing a, a network of radiation and weather monitoring stations in communities around the test site uh, that involves the public directly in the monitoring process and educates them with regards to what we know about health effects, what the mythology is, and, and uh, uh, trains people in the communities to be points of contact. So I've always been a huge proponent both in my archaeological research and then in the uh, radiation world of bringing science to the public in an understandable form. And uh, as I developed uh, my, my own disorder in this area, I became very passionate about the, uh, uh, conveying this information to the public as well. And over the past few, uh, few years, uh, five, six years especially, as some of the uh, uh, more recent uh, research on, on video games has been uh, conducted, it forced me to look deep back into my own past yet again and see how some of my uh, early and later gaming behavior may have been uh, connected with my gambling behavior. So hope, hopefully I'll illuminate a lot of these areas uh, for you. Uh, I've put both the Nevada Council and the DRI logos up here because both of those organizations have been very supportive. I've uh, had the opportunity to le leverage some 
internal research dollars at DRI to uh, do a study looking at the impact of uh, problem gambling in, in 11 Native American tribal communities here in, in Nevada and conduct outreach in those communities as well. I've worked with indigenous populations throughout my career in all of those areas that I, that I mentioned. And so I, I do want to start out with um, uh, by reading in its entire, the entirety of this land acknowledgement that I was involved in developing along with uh, listening sessions with members of several tribes here in Nevada and across the Southwest. Um, and this is DRI's official statement. Now, we of the Desert Research Institute acknowledge that the places where we conduct science have deep ancestral ties to the indigenous peoples who have inhabited these lands since time immemorial, and we recognize these communities continue to thrive today. We respect traditional knowledge systems and indigenous wisdom that originated before the Western scientific approach and that evolved with and cannot be separated from these sacred lands. We value these knowledge systems that continue today as a way of understanding our intrinsic relationship with land, water, air, people, and ecosystems. We express our gratitude for the opportunity to live and work on and in proximity to these traditional homelands. We acknowledge the original and continued sovereignty of native nations in our region, Numa, Nua, Washoe, and everywhere. This is our commitment to conducting science with a conscience, which includes decolonizing science and rejecting the beliefs that have led to physical and cultural removal of indigenous peoples from their traditional homelands so that our work is respectful, collaborative, and beneficial for all. We will listen to, include, and elevate diverse ways of cultivating knowledge and ally with indigenous scientists. Thank you for letting me read that statement. Um, just a, a little trigger warning here, many of the slides in this presentation do contain gaming and or gambling imagery, not unexpected, I know, at a, at a conference on problem gambling, but uh, I don't want any of that to be unexpected. So uh, as I was preparing for this presentation, um, I, I uh, discovered some new things uh, about my, myself as I was delving back into the past, because in the beginning, at least for me, there was Pong, and I suspect there are uh, some of a certain age who, who will remember this. This um, was a hugely popular game that was actually invented by an engineer at Atari as part of a training exercise. And Atari was um, so happy with this that they marketed it first as an arcade game, and it was so popular. This is one of the first widely available and marketed games you could hook up to your TV at home. And uh, when I moved from uh, Spokane, Washington, uh, following um, my mom's divorce from her second husband to live with my dad in Lubbock, Texas, just prior to the divorce of, uh, from his second wife, um, I, uh, one of the gifts I got uh, after that move was the Pong game. And this, this was such a huge thing. You know, it made me a little bit popular in, in an otherwise um, very, um, uh, a very difficult setting for me going from Spokane, Washington to Lubbock, Texas and not understanding half of the words people were saying with that West Texas drawl. And, uh, but this was, this was a way for me to engage with other people. And looking, looking back, I can also see that while I probably would not have qualified for having a clinically diagnosable gaming disorder, I did start to use gaming in some problematic ways uh, to, to escape from things that were going on in the household that were pretty, pretty un, unpleasant. This was my first experience though. So I, 1976 is when I acquired this. And then uh, Atari, in very short order, came out with some really nice gaming consoles. This is the Atari 2600, um, uh, which came out in 1977. I was one of the early consumers of this gaming console. And this screenshot I actually got off of eBay uh, about three weeks ago. This console was selling for $1,600 today on eBay. So I'm thinking, oh, all of these old systems I used to have, right? Those early Apple Macintoshes and, and everything else. And as I was going through some of the cassettes online that were available with this system, I came across this one called Casino and I recognized the graphic immediately. And so this is one of the games I had had, you know, at the 
the age of, it would have been 12, 11 or 12 years old. Um, very rudimentary kind of a blackjack and five card stud uh, poker uh, computer games. But um, this was also the time in my move to Texas when I was first introduced to regular gambling activities in the household. We know that this is a risk factor for developing a gambling disorder later on in life. Early exposure and participation in gambling activities as a child is a risk factor. And most of us learn to gamble in the home without thinking of it as gambling. A um, little more on that later. Uh, then in high school came the TI-99 4A. There were some others, the Commodore and, and things that were available before this, but one of the earliest uh, kind of home computer systems I, I became aware of that I learned to do some rudimentary uh, programming on, and it too had uh, cassettes that, that had um, uh, gambling-related games on them that I remember uh, using. And then there were all sorts of technological uh, innovations. All of a sudden, you could, you could save your programming uh, to a cassette recorder and also uh, use the cassette recorder to transmit these data you know over the phone to your friends you know and who doesn't remember uh oh I hear it up here but not anywhere else okay Right? I wish my brain were wired to a functional MRI scan right now to see what's happening because, you know, the first time I, I came across this, this uh, you know, online and played it, it's like, oh, there was such a feeling of nostalgia for that sound, you know, wondering, am I going to connect successfully, seeing that little prompt, say, yes, I'm connected, you know, or my, my data has saved appropriately. It was always, you know, quite, quite an adventure. So this was, yeah, a little walk down memory lane for me. Oh, sorry, okay, that's enough of that. Uh, but meanwhile, oh, and I, I'm, I'm the one in the middle, by the way, in case there's uh, uh, any question. You know, I was, I was cultivating uh, all of these habits within my life as a child, introduced to first to horse racing by my father at the age of 10. A lot of our family trips would be uh, uh, from going from Lubbock, Texas to Rio Doso, New Mexico, uh, to camp in the mountains outside of town, which I suspect was my dad's way of saving money on hotel rooms so that he had more to gamble on the horses during the day. But be that as it may, it was fun as a kid. And we'd go in and we'd spend the whole day at the racetrack, which was also so fun as a kid because my dad would give each of the kids 20 bucks and that was ours to gamble on the horses for the day and so we would tell uh, our father you know which horse to put money on so I was in action from the age of 10 later on my father would teach me how to play poker and by the time I was in high school I was playing in a regular weekly poker game with my own father and a bunch of other mostly university professors from Texas Tech which is where my father taught in the music department the other part of my life that I didn't mention in my introduction um, I am a professional cellist also with the Las Vegas Philharmonic since its inception in 1999. I've gotten to play with lots of wonderful personalities who need to hire orchestras as they come through the strip. I'll get to play with the Eagles later on this month and I'm pretty jazzed about that, right? They were already a thing when I was a little kid growing up, so you know they're a little bit long in the tooth but still great. Exciting things like that, but my big fantasy when I moved to Las Vegas was about the World Series of Poker and saving up enough money to enter that big game. And that was a fantasy that was, was never realized, although I would come to recognize one day I had lost enough money playing video poker, which became my primary gambling addiction, to have entered the big game at the World Series of Poker every single year since I'd lived in Vegas and never had. Um, after I moved to Las Vegas in 1991, um, I set games aside for, for a little while, uh, concentrated on my job and, and some music um, and, you know, saving up money. I was still playing live poker in the casino. It still had not become a problem for me at this point. But in the late 90s, um, I became aware of this uh, game called Ultima Online. And this is one of the earliest, what we call, massively multiplayer online uh, role-playing games. So there were servers, several servers worldwide, and you could log into this world and create a character with an avatar. You could tr 
tr uh, choose to have a, a trade. You could be a, a carpenter or a, a fisherman or a, a warrior, and you had to practice your skills over and over again to build up those stats. And you could interact in real time with people in this world and chat. The, the, you know, your verbiage would appear above your head. And this was just, this was a remarkable thing. And I, I really got heavily involved. And this was also the, the time that my gambling was, was just starting to get uh, problematic. And my first wife and I used to uh, come home from work and we would, we would sit in the same room with one another and log into our uh, respective uh, computer consoles onto this game. And we would, you know, our characters would march around this world and we'd talk with each other, you know, kind of like kids in the same room or people in the same room will chat with each other on the phone instead of actually conversing. And so we engaged in this behavior. And it was also around this time that, that I uh, started doing some online um, gambling. This was when the online gambling world was still in a gray world legally. They hadn't quite put the, put the hammer down and said, you know, all these offshore gambling sites, we're going to make those illegal. And unless you're licensed within our state, it's not legal. But until that time, I was, I was making use of those platforms. And so sometimes I'd go back and forth between uh, this, uh, this game and um, that online gambling site. And even at this, this time, almost 25 years ago, uh, these uh, virtual items uh, and characters within these worlds, uh, you, you, you saw a, um, uh, a marketplace develop online, and first on eBay until they kind of, they, they put, the, put the wraps on that after a year or so, and, but there are other, other um, marketplaces that popped up online where you could build up your character. This is a, a little article from 2000 that talks about uh, uh, an Ultima Online character, this game that I played, selling for $521, right? So this is way back in, in 2000, very early on. So this is not a new thing that we're seeing, seeing um, these virtual items have real worth and the opportunity to find ways to build those up, trade them online back and forth. So there is a, a real dollar value uh, placed on some of these um, items. And, and the, the, the virtual va value of a lot of these things is hugely important to the people who engage in this world. So uh, when we talk about, when I'll talk about gambling later on, um, uh, some of those uh, definitions matter. And so briefly, uh, I'm going to revisit this. Some folks have already talked about that. But before we talk about problematic gambling and gaming, and a lot of the slides I'm using today, by the way, are, are the slides that I use in my presentations with parents and kids to talk about these issues. We define what is gambling. Uh, we heard from one of the presentations yesterday a pretty low rate of reported lifetime um, uh, participation in gambling activities. I suspect that's just because they, they did not define the range of activities that can constitute gambling. Because when I go into all of the high schools and give these presentations, one of the questions I ask is, how many of you have ever gambled on anything in your life? And usually 40 or 50 percent of the kids might think about it and maybe raise their hand. But then when we define what gambling can be, basically wagering something of value to try and win something of value where the outcome is uncertain, whether it's based on chance, skill, or a combination of the two. And we go through this little exercises, which of these can be gambling? Some of them right away you would say, yes, slot machines, blackjack, bingo, of course, horse racing, sports betting, lottery, yes, raffle. People say, well, raffle, no, I'm really, I'm buying something, I'm making a donation to a cause, maybe I have a chance to win. Well, you're, you're putting down some money with a, with a chance to win something where the outcome is uncertain, poker, video games. And of course, all of the above can be gambling if there's a wager in, involved, right? And uh, so then I asked the question again, and at that point, probably 80 to 90% of the kids in these classes will raise their hand. And this again, these are high school age kids. When I do this for student athlete groups, uh, just before the pandemic, the year before the pandemic, I spoke to the Liberty High School incoming freshman football team incoming freshman football team. And I asked this question in a room full of about 100 athletes, and they're actually from the wrestling team, golf team, a few volleyball members as well. Almost universally, the first time I asked that question, how, how many of you have ever bet on anything in your life? Those hands shot up without thinking about it. 
So these kids are already engaged in betting activities, a lot of them sports related, between friends, things like this, fantasy sports, they've been becoming involved in, in leagues. And this is happening uh, very young and particularly uh, among our young athletes, it's, it's an issue because this can be a very problematic for them if they hope to go on and play at the NCAA level where they will be prohibited from uh, wagering on any sports at any level, not only their own sport, uh, if they do so, it jeopardizes their ability to play. And if their scholarship is tied to, to um, uh, that athletic activity, they're uh, jeopardizing their college education as well. 25% of male athletes, NCAA athletes, admit to having wagered on sports within the previous year. In a 16-year longitudinal study by Jeff Derevinsky, uh, McGill um, University up in Canada. So it, it, very problematic. A few general facts. There's some form of gambling that's legal in 48 of 50 states, not just Nevada. Only two states where gambling is entirely illegal. Anybody know what those two are? Yay, all right. Somebody's been listening to some presentations. Utah and Hawaii, and there's plenty of illegal gambling going on in both of those places. About 85% of adults uh, across the U.S. report having gambled at least once in their lifetimes. Almost two-thirds report having gambled within the past year. So this is a very, very normalized uh, behavior now in the U.S. The vast majority, of course, of people who choose to gamble can do so for fun and entertainment. They can set those limits of both money and time and stick to that plan, and they can gamble at appropriate times as opposed to when they were supposed to be uh, at work like I did, that was my MO because it was the easiest way to hide the fact I was gambling from my family. My supervisor lived in another town and so I could delegate a lot of my responsibility to other faculty and students and, and get away with it. And of course the vast majority experience no long-term harmful effects. Um, in Nevada, a slightly higher participation, about 90% uh, of adults report having gambled in their lifetime. Seven out of 10 youth under the age of 18. These data are from a survey that's, that's uh, more than 20 years old now. We're way past time when we need to do a, a statewide prevalence study of some kind to see where we are today. Um, you know, that study suggested that we have uh, among the highest problem gambling rates in the country as many 6% of adults and 2% of youth before where they leave high school, may have serious problems. There have been some criticisms of that study and some adjustments of that figure to suggest it may be closer to somewhere between two and a half and four and a half percent. But even if that lower number is true, that still puts us two to four times higher than most other states uh, in the, the nation. I'll I won't go through these. Um, these are signs and symptoms of gambling disorder from the uh, DSM-5, uh, the one change from the previous uh, version when it used to be called pathological gambling was the removal of the um, uh, uh, criminal uh, acts, uh, which still occurs. I won't go into the details of, of why that, that happened. And the reason I, I talk about all of this when I'm talking to both the kids and the parents is we're gonna get to some serious overlap here in a bit between these two activities. And I want to make sure um, that the kids are getting, um, uh, and the parents are getting information on both. So let's transition now uh, to gaming disorder and why we're talking about it um, more and more. Um, in part, we have the global pandemic to thank for this. Uh, the global pandemic, as many people have alluded to, has brought us a lot of those risk factors for uh, mental health disorders across the board, including addictive disorders, right? Uh, I haven't met anyone uh, yet who had, did not experience some social isolation during the past two years, whether that's from friends, family, coworkers, some type of loss, right? A lot of us experienced uh, loss of loved, one, loved ones. One out of every 300 people in this country lost their lives over the past two years from COVID. And so if you think how that impacts the community and, uh, and uh, people across the board, it's tremendous. Loss of relationships, loss of financial security for many for at least part of that time, loss of connection to all of those services, uh, medical, mental health services, recreational services, the depression and anxiety that goes along with all these things. If, if the pandemic brought us one good thing, it was the ramp up of telehealth, right, that, 
has been kind of slow over the years, and even the recovery community, right? It's been tremendously important for people to be able to log on online. I, you know, now I know I can, uh, you know, not only are there the, the 100 meetings a week that existed in Las Vegas that I could visit physically between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m., now if I'm somebody who wakes up in the middle of the night at 2.30 a.m. and has that urge, I know there's a, a resource that, you know, on my phone or my computer, I can log on to a GA meeting in the UK and, and get, get some of that medicine. So that's one good thing that's happened. At the same time, um, uh, really uh, immediately before the pandemic, the uh, video game industry had become worth more than the film and music industries combined, if you can believe it or not. And in 2020, the year of the pandemic, spending on video games um, reached an all-time high, $57 billion, that was 60, a little over $60 billion last year, worldwide worth of over $150 billion, uh, saw records set month to month during the pandemic. Um, Lots of, of spending both on premium console gaming and, and free to play, which I'll get in, into here in a bit. $23 billion spent on free to play games. Two weeks into the, uh, the shutdowns and the stay at home orders due to the pandemic, the World Health Organization came out with a, an article and announcement encouraging people to play video games during the pandemic, looking for things to do get out those video games to pass the time so that you don't get bored. And you know, a lot of us in both the uh, recovery and treatment and research world cringed a little bit when this happened because this was the organization, World Health Organization was actually the first and, and so far only because American Psychiatric Association hasn't, hasn't quite officially recognized internet gaming disorder as a uh, standalone clinically diagnosable illness. It's being studied, uh, I'll talk about that in, in a moment. But the World Health Organization, the year before the pandemic, had already officially recognized this as a diagnosable disorder in the ICD-11. And they uh, encouraged this. Several people um, called them out. A young gentleman named Cam Adair, who I'll speak about here in a few minutes, put together a satirical YouTube video calling them, them out. Uh, and indeed, a couple days later, they did kind of reprint this suggestion and call attention to the fact that it could become problematic for some people and here's where you can go for information on that. But we saw an increase uh, about 75% worldwide in both online and uh, a gambling and gaming platforms during that first year of the pandemic. That really has not gone down uh, much, if at all. So people, even when the um, brick and mortar opportunities shut down in whatever country, they found online opportunities to engage uh, in. Um, there's some early research Research in the pandemic out of Australia by Sally Gainsbury, uh, which looked at um, people who had a problematic gambling histories and asked them questions about their behavior. Um, about 40% uh, reported that it, it actually turned out to be an opportunity uh, for them to reevaluate um, uh, what they'd been doing. It helped them uh, get into recovery. Uh, but another 25%, I think it was, reported that um, they were gambling at the same level, and 35% actually reported gambling more during the pan pandemic, right? So there's this kind of a spectrum of different responses within people who had already experienced some uh, problem gambling behaviors. This is uh, Roblox, um, which for those of you that don't know is, is an online platform where people can create their own, own games and put them out there for other uh, people to play. This is incredibly popular with um, kids. It, it's, it's gotten some high marks for create the creative process, engaging kids in it. And, and let me say before I forget that while I am talking about a lot of the potential negative aspects of games, Gaming. I don't want this to sound like an anti-gaming talk. It is not that at all. This is just in recognition, as we know with, with gambling, with gaming disorder, probably affects a very small percentage, maybe one to three percent. We really don't know uh, what the prevalence is yet. Small percentage. For the majority of people, it, it is entertainment, um, but we want to get the word out for, for people to realize that uh, it can be problematic. But all sorts of positive things about around gaming. It can be very pro-social, can uh, help with educational process. And, uh, lots of teachers use certain types of games to teach. It can have rehabilitative uh, 
uh, positive um, effects for those that have experienced physical or traumatic brain injuries and helping that process. So there's a whole range of, of, of um, uh, positive, uh, potential positive effects that I want people to be uh, aware of. Um, but this is just Roblox engagement daily activity uh, users from the end of 2018. And you'll notice a, you know, a, a steady but slow increase through the fourth quarter of, of 2000. 19 here, and then all of a sudden the pandemic hits, and you see quite, quite a jump um, in the first quarter of 2020, and then an even bigger jump in the second quarter of 2020, and significant continued expansion uh, right up through the end of this past year. That that is probably continuing, and this this by the way is measured in. Um, this is uh, daily users in millions. So that far, that high column on the right-hand side, fourth quarter of 2021, uh, 50 million daily users at that point in time. So I'm sure we have exceeded that at this point. So who's playing? And kids always get the bad rap when we talk about, about video gaming, right? But the average age of today's game players, 32 to 34 years old. I suspect there are people in this audience who are in that age range. Average gamer has been playing for 14 years, right? So, so obviously if that's the average, there are significant numbers of people playing in older age demographic and younger uh, age demographic. Today, play is roughly split between males and females. It used to be much more male dominated. Today, we're getting very close. Uh, the types of games may be uh, somewhat different, but the, the uh, um, uh, breakdown by gender is, is almost 50-50. And age 50 plus, particularly among women, is one of the fastest growing demographics for video games. So I'm not only talking about consoles, PC games, talking about your phone apps, right? You're gonna recognize some of these very shortly. But why are we playing? And this can be very important in terms of, uh, you know, if you have someone with problematic behavior, figuring out exactly what types of their gaming and, and games they are playing, as well as what that game is um, uh, uh, fulfilling in their lives, or what is it replacing in their lives, can be very important to identifying uh, um, uh, uh, replacements that are healthy for that games and other types of games that may not be problematic because for most people they're going to be able to either transition to other types of games uh, you know once they recognize why they're playing or even you know uh, um, uh, just reduce that gameplay so of course hopefully most of us are, are doing it strictly for entertainment for fun uh, relieving boredom can be a double-edged sword. Um, you know, we don't want this to just be the go-to activity. Uh, you know, when our, our child is bored, how many of you have children who are constantly bored? Anybody out there or were when you had children, right? And this is one of the questions I ask the kids. How many of you think of yourselves as easily bored? And somewhere between one-third and two-thirds of the class will, will raise their hand, and we'll, we'll go into that discussion here in a bit. Failure is very low risk. Uh, in the digital world, and I need to rewrite this, um, unlike the physical world, I'm, I'm going to talk in a little bit about why we shouldn't refer to it as the virtual world and the real world, and I need to alter my own slide here. Failure is very low risk in the digital world, unlike the physical world where failure can have serious repercussions in somebody's life. Social connection is very, very important for some people within the games. Did anybody use games in any way during the pandemic to stay in touch with friends or family? How many of you got out there? A few of you, four or five. In the classrooms I talk to, a significant percentage of the kids will raise their hand that they have stayed in touch with their friends through games. So these social connections can be very, very uh, important. And I, I will often caution parents who, who talk about completely disconnecting their child from that uh, world as a, as a punishment to try and find some, some middle ground there because some of the outcomes can be pretty deleterious for, for cutting off that social connection. Some of those connections may be the most important connections in their lives for, for talking about issues they are uncomfortable with, with talking with people in the physical world, right? Um, escape, again, a double-edged sword. All of us need that, those happy places to go to and those, those times to you know, escape from our, our, our work environment, uh, escape from a trauma momentarily. But if this is becoming the go-to way of, of coping uh, uh, as a coping mechanism for all areas of your life, that, of course, is problematic. Achieving goals in games is 
very measurable. You see your progress. You see the outcomes of your work within those games. You know what you have to do. Not always true in the physical world, right? Or it's a little bit uh, more nebulous. There's a sense of certainty within games. There's, there are rules that generally don't change. You know exactly how you fit into those rules. Also a sense of personal control within those games, of, of your character, of who you present yourself as, right? Somebody who is, who is very um, uh, you know, socially awkward in physical situations may not feel that way in the gaming world where they're not judged by their appearance or, uh, or people who know them through other, uh, other behaviors. They can be somebody else and be judged just by how they interact with people uh, in the game or their ability to play that game. And parents hate this one, and I say, yes, gaming is a viable career for some today. This is an actual pathway to an education for some. Last year, Harrisburg University in Pennsylvania became the first university in the country to offer full ride scholarships to all 23 roster spots of its eSports team. And I will talk about eSports a little later on. But a lot of the major universities uh, are developing eSports teams, or have eSports teams, and offer at least partial or full scholarships to at least a portion of their rosters. So the importance, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of those issues later on. Um, just before the pandemic, New York Times published this article saying, can you really be addicted to video games? And the, the byline under it, latest research suggests it's not far-fetched at all, especially when you consider all the societal and cultural factors that make today's game so attractive. And um, even though I can recognize today that some of my own behaviors were become, becoming problematic behind the, the gaming, the, the nature of games today is so different from that time that I was engaging with games. They are so incredibly immersive. They are often never ending. They are mostly connected to the internet, whether that's a, a phone game or a PC game, the ability to constantly update what's available in these online worlds. And there, of course, there are very different types of games across, these, uh, across the spectrum, but lots, lots of factors make, make games much more attractive for escaping into. And so, but it brings up the question, you know, when is gaming really a problem? I mentioned how normalized this is uh, across the age. Uh, spectrums, and I, I often use um, a, a similar slide in presentations when I'm talking about um, uh, gambling, but in, the, in this case, you know, I, I'll ask the kids or this audience, does this young man, we can't tell how young he is really, does this, is this somebody with a, a problem? Or why or why not? Any thoughts, thoughts out there? What's that? We don't know. Well, yes, I, this is the wrong audience to ask that question because obviously, you know, we, we don't know, right? We, we can't look at a, at a moment in time and know anything about that person's behavior and whether this is representative of, of an everyday thing, part of a chronic and progressive behavior that is negatively impacting this person's life. Maybe he has just missed that, you know, level 10 for the fifth time in a row by 0.2 seconds and he's frustrated in the moment or maybe he's, he's fallen asleep because he... Yeah, maybe this one time he was. Uh, you know, and even you know, recreational gamers and gamblers have those moments where they will use that behavior in an unhealthy way, but it's not, again, part of an escalating, chronic, and progressive uh, thing within their lives. So here's how the World Health Organization defines gaming disorder in the ICD-11. A pattern is pretty simple, a pattern of gaming behavior digital gaming or video gaming characterized by one, impaired control. Impaired control over gaming. So that inability to consistently set limits of, of time or money on that game and keep to them. Increasing priority given to gaming over other activities to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests and daily activities that, that you once enjoyed. And then finally, continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. And if you're a yes to all three of these, there's a you know, good chance that you might be clinically diagnosable. Very, very uh, simple uh, way of looking at it. Here's what the, the DSM-5 has as its proposed criteria for studying this. And, you're, and you will now see why I put the, the criteria for gambling disorder up in that early uh, screen. 
almost, almost identical, right? In fact, I put them together on this, this slide so you could kind of compare them. The only thing, the only uh, areas where there's not a direct one to one relationship within the diagnosis criteria, isolation and bailouts, and quite frankly, I can make a pretty strong argument that both of those things occur in gaming and gambling too, right? Even though they are not uh, uh, being looked at officially as, as um, uh, for, for diagnosis. And this is a study that just came out uh, last year. It's a, a Delphi study, which in, involves, you know, getting a, a bunch of experts, these are a bunch of experts from across the world in both the clinical and research uh, realm to look at questions around the diagnostic criteria in both the DSM-5 and ICD-11. Uh, you know, go back and forth with discussions, evaluations of these until you reach a, a consensus. And basically, after this process, there was expert agreement that some DSM-5, the proposed criteria are not clinically relevant. Tolerance and deception among those, and they may actually pathologize non-problematic patterns of gaming, whereas ICD-11 diagnostic guidelines are likely to diagnose gaming disorder adequately and avoid pathologizing. So, you know, the last thing we want to do is pathologize a behavior that, that's not, right, and diagnose some, someone with a mental illness who really doesn't have one. They may still be, you know, transitioning and engaging in problematic behaviors based on some of those criteria that warrant some brief in, uh, interventions and discussions around that activity, but I suspect um, that when, I, I don't think there's going to be an if here, that when the final criteria come out in the DSM-5, they are going to look somewhat closer to, to, to the ICD-11. I'm just guessing. I don't have any insider knowledge on that. But some of these studies suggest uh, that they, they may be better at uh, clinically diagnosing. So, what are some general things that we should all be aware of about video games, particularly those of us uh, who are parents, and you're probably at least peripherally aware that there is a rating system for video games, just like there is a rating system for the movies, right? G, PG, PG-13, R, NC-17, X. And the same sort of thing exists in the video game uh, universe through the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. Uh, it's a good general guide, but I'm going to mention some exceptions here in a moment. Uh, if, it's, if it's got this E rating, generally that means it's, it's suitable for, for all ages. There's not going to be something that's, that's going to tend to be problematic. Everyone 10 plus, very self-explanatory, generally suitable for ages 10 and up. You, you might get mild cartoon violence, some very mild profanity, poo-poo, and you know, things like that uh, in, in the games, but not much more severe. At the teen rating and above, uh, which is considered uh, by the rating industry to be generally suitable for ages 13 and up, is when you can start to see games that contain simulated gambling. So while kids are not, uh, or adults are not, gambling with real money, um, these games are teaching people how many gambling games that we see in casinos are actually work, right? So slot machines, roulette wheels, things like blackjack, these, these types of games can start to appear. And while you're only spending virtual currency, for some people, that virtual concern currency has a real value compared to what they might be able to get or win in the game. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the problematic things around uh, social casinos right, right at the end. Um, and these are, these are online um, social expressions of casinos where you can't win actually money, win actual money, but boy, can you lose lots and lots and lots and lots of actual money in that process. At the M rating for mature, generally suitable for uh, ages 17 and up. This is when you can get, start to get really graphic violence, graphic sexual situations, uh, graphic profanity uh, in the storyline. Uh, we should all be familiar with that um, uh, as parents and even kids. I'm talking about you know, some of the reasons with kids why uh, they should be concerned. Adults only 18 plus may actually contain gambling with real money in jurisdictions that allow for that. And I said these are a good general guide because even in that E for everyone category, there are some exceptions at NBA 2K. The NBA game, very popular, it's rated E for everyone. It has gambling imagery in it. It's got some, you know, some, some drafts of players and when you get players on your team, kind of a, almost a slot machine look in, in how, the, how you get those players. 
it's not teaching anybody to gamble, and, and in fact, this was their rationalization as to why it escaped the, the uh, teen uh, rating for that, was that it's not actually teaching anyone to gamble. But somebody sure thought it was a hook for play uh, for kids to have that gambling imagery within the game, right? And if they're not concerned uh, about that, um, uh, uh, that marketing uh, piece, why, why won't they just get rid of it, right? So, you know, that's, that's the conversation, one of the conversations that needs to be had. And even some games that are marketed as educational games, I'm happy to say this one no longer exists, but this is one uh, that Cam Adair, who I'll talk about uh, momentarily, uh, shared with me. Um, this was one called Kid Doctor, where you could, as a child, choose to be a doctor or a dentist and treat other children and make them well. This all sounds great, right? Uh, this is marketed to kids age five and six, by the way. And uh, occasionally, this, um, this uh, uh, icon would pop up that gave them the ability to purchase add-ons to this game. So, uh, you know, at age five or six, kids have no concept of what money is, the fact that these games are tied to their parents' credit cards or checking accounts. And even if their mom or dad has said, hey, when this pops up, click on that little red X to close out this window. If you do that in this game, if you click out without making a purchase, this image of a crying child pops up on the screen. How manipulative is that? Five or six year old child being made to feel bad for not making a purchase online. Really incredibly uh, predatory. Um, these are from PartyCasino.com. These are some of the more popular games that are out there that actually require you to gamble within the games. Again, you're not gambling for real money, but it requires you to, to play poker or other types of gambling games within them to advance within the games. Fortunately, all these ones up here are rated M for Mature, so that's, that's uh, very appropriate in these cases. Uh, but let's talk about freemium games, which I alluded to a little early on. Who can tell me what a freemium game is? Or guess, if you don't know. Yes? Free to play, but you have to pay for upgrades. Exactly right. Free to play. Games are absolutely free to download, absolutely free to play, but they require money to unlock certain features or progress more rapidly in the game. Yeah. Here are some popular games that some of you may recognize. Farmville, Clash of Clans, Plants vs. Zombies, Candy Crush, Words with Friends. Between myself and my daughter, uh, who is 16 now, we have played all of these. Er fairly early on in my recovery, I got into Candy Crush for a while, and then I started to find myself uh, spending more and more money each month, and it's like, wow, this is, this is a problem for me, and I need to, I need to stop it. Even though um, it, it's not, uh, not affecting the reward center in the brain quite, quite the same way as another feature that I'll talk about in just a moment, um, uh, some of these microtransactions available in these games can in and of themselves become very problematic for people. You will, they will always be in 99 cent increments, right? A little bit of the persuasive psychology about, oh, it's, it's not a dollar, I'm saving a little money on that. 99 cents, dollar 99, 599, 99, 99, right? You can buy these packages within the, the games. Um, you also know exactly what you're getting for those purchases. 90% um, of the revenue from the Apple App Store across the board for games are from those that are completely free to download and play. You don't have to spend a cent. Lots of ways to monetize these games. They can make you pay to download. They can make you get a subscription, a monthly subscription to pay for it. They can do it through advertising. Or they can give it to you just completely free and develop features within those games that are going to make it attractive for you to spend lots of money over time. So 90% of those tens of billions of dollars I mentioned in that early slide, games that are completely free to download and play. So let's talk about loot boxes because these have gotten a lot of attention, especially over the past few years uh, in video games. Um, who wants to tell me what, what a loot box is? Anybody out there? What's that? Something you can pay for or win. Something you can, you do have to pay for it, and you do technically win something, but, but what, what makes these features particularly of concern, do you think? You don't, you don't know what's in it. Completely randomized set of contents. So, I, did I wander outside my area? Sorry, thank you. 
Um, completely randomized set of contents. You don't know what you're getting. What does this sound like? Right? This is the same persuasive psychology that's used with slot machines. You put that dollar in, you pull the handle or push the button, and you are hoping for that super rare outcome, the jackpot. You're more likely to get nothing or a very minimal payback that keeps you playing or keeps you in action. But occasionally, you're going to get that super rare piece of armor or that super rare uh, um, uh, weapon or that skin that changes your appearance and gives you more credibility in the game, right? And boy, that's a, that's a big hook, especially if you hit one of those early on in your tries. It's like, wow, this is a great way to build up my character within the game. But yes, loot boxes, basically a usable virtual item which can be opened to receive loot, uh, but a completely uh, random set of, uh, of, of content. So this is hitting, hitting the brain and uh, the brain uh, the brain's reward system in the same way uh, as gambling is. And so this is a tremendous concern of both uh, uh, those of us in the treatment and research communities because if, if it is true that it is, it is hitting the brain the same way gambling does, we do know that there uh, absolutely is a connection between early engagement in gambling activities and the possibility of developing a gambling disorder later on in life. So we need to be super careful with these. And in fact, these features have been defined and regulated as a type of gambling in many other countries. It would not be unusual. Um, well, it might be a little bit unusual if it is at some point regulated as such in the United States. But in fact, three years ago, I know Senator Hawley actually introduced some legislation to consider this. It went nowhere uh, at the time. I'll talk about a few more of those in, in a moment. These, these features are very prevalent within uh, iPhone and Android uh, downloads. 58% of Google Play Store uh, games contain loot boxes. 59% of the top iPhone games contain loot boxes. 93% of the Android games and 95% of the iPhone games that featured loot boxes were deemed suitable for children age 12 plus. Really, I think these are, are games that, that should get, if they have these features, probably at least a 17 plus uh, category, my personal opinion. These are examples of popular games that have loot box features in them. Save the World was actually one of the versions of Fortnite. Hugely popular. Uh, my daughter likes this game. Uh, she knows what loot boxes are and she knows that she's not allowed to make these purchases. Let her make other types of purchases um, uh, within other types of games, but she is to stay away from uh, loot boxes in particular. But all of these games have loot box features uh, within them. Here's an article from The Mirror in the UK, again, just before the pandemic. Kids splashing cash, chasing losses on online games like Fortnite are gambling. The Children's Commissioner says children who spend hundreds of pounds on online gaming should be classified as gamblers. So uh, had that conversation in the UK. They, uh, Fortnite was actually sued. Epic Games was sued uh, around this loot box feature in their games because it turned out that not only um, were the, um, the people who are using the, the loot box features getting an advantage, which seems reasonable within the games for the, the items they purchased, they had an algorithm that was actually disadvantaging the normal players who chose not to engage in purchases. And when this came out, um, they settled out of court. They paid $50 in cash to everybody who had bought one of these features in the past. And they were also kind enough to give everybody a thousand V-Bucks, which is the virtual currency within the game, to bring them back into the fold. It wasn't that nice of them. They knew they were going to get all of those $50 payments back from most of those people, I, I suspect. Um, just a year ago, games with loot boxes were officially banned for minors in Germany. You cannot buy these games if you are a minor. Other countries that have regulated them, Japan, China, Netherlands, Belgium, UK, I don't think as officially, but still considering it. Um, there have been some uh, early studies on looking at this gateway hypothesis, right? This idea that if I am engaging in, in purchases of loot box uh, as a child, am I going to transition into having a gambling problem? Or as an adult, am I going to transition into having a gambling problem? So far, the research suggests no, but again, this is, this is one of the earliest studies. They saw a, a, at best only a small correlation between overall gambling and video game engagement, right? So this is non-problematic, this is overall gambling, and less evidence to support a direct relationship between problem gaming and problem gambling. However, they did show that problem gambling symptoms were positively related to loot box purchases. 
So, um, and this is something that a number of other studies have, have found. There is a correlation between people who have problematic gambling behavior and who also game uh, in terms of their purchasing um, uh, loot boxes problematically, right? So until we better understand uh, what the relationship is and how it occurs, I think we should err on the side of caution in terms of our kids, especially using these uh, features within games. So is gambling disorder really serious? And I think it's always best to hear, hear from someone with lived experience. This gentleman, uh, Cam Adair, who is a, a remarkable uh, young man. Um, I'll tell you more about it. This is a video from about nine years ago, but it's still pretty relevant. And he came and spoke at this conference, I think not long after he made this uh, TEDx talk. Oh, wrong one, sorry. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming up here. And full screen. It's just about six minutes long, not very long. So, you know, very brief discussion. I would encourage you to Google Cam's name online. You can find lots of uh, uh, things that he's done since. One of the things he did not get into in this particular um, uh, talk was really how dramatically this affected his life. In fact, he had gotten to the point, he had written a suicide note to his parents uh, over his gaming and planned to end his own life. I have not had conversations with what that epiphany was that, that um, that led him uh, out of that. But he uh, put together this site called GameQuitters.com, which is a fantastic resource. Without even a, a high school education, when he came here and he did his presentation on his website and what it included, I said, so did you work with psychologists in putting this together? Or he's like, no, no. well, you must have at least read some journal articles, right? You know, he had intuitively hit on a lot of the princ principles of cognitive behavioral therapy that we, we recognize as, as uh, often a successful treatment in this area within the context of the site. I mean, he set, on this, on this, set up this online support community for both uh, the gamers and or significant others of gamers where they could interact and share their stories, uh, one and two minute videos of advice of things that had worked from him. Ultimately, he developed a couple programs. Um, at, most of the stuff on his site is free, but there are a couple programs you can download. They're really, about the same that you'd spend on a brand new video game, honestly, for an Xbox or something, and towards one I think called Reboot, the other is Respawn, one is for you know, gamers, one is for the significant others on, on advice on how to go through this process. And ultimately, he, he did work with psychologists and realized his, his dream of developing a, a clinical training for this, which I'll, I'll mention the website for uh, here in a short amount of time. But he is, he's kind of a, a world-recognized expert. I, he might be 30. Now, <laughs> again, this is, this is nine years ago. I mean, he might be in his early 30s now, but uh, fantastic. So a couple uh, bits of advice. I'll try to get through this quickly. I want to leave a little time for question here. Uh, is more advice from Cam, but also you will see this in the uh, online clinical training if you choose to engage in it. Reframe your discussions when you're talking, about, uh, talking with people about the gaming environment. We were kind of... Um, we've kind of become uh, accustomed to using the terms virtual world and real world, right? In real life, in the virtual life. These can actually further stigmatize people who game who already may feel stig stigmatized just by that label of a game. Both these wor worlds are subjectively real to the people who are engaged in them for some of the reasons I've already discussed. So try to use the terms digital world or online world and physical world instead. There's no judgment conveyed by either of those terms. They recognize them both as, as worlds, right? There's not one that's real and one that's not. Uh, and also use the word gamer with an individual only if that person self-identifies as a gamer, unless you're using the term generally, but many who play digital games don't think of themselves uh, as gamers, and unless they label themselves as that, um, you shouldn't either in those discussions. 
How do I know if it's a problem? Uh, you know, early on, Cam added a, a list of questions to his website, which were just the DSM proposed criteria changed to the form uh, of questions. So that's a resource we've downloaded and used. I've done the same thing here with the ICD-11 questions. Again, much much simpler, uh, but but having all that whole list from the DSM-5, I think, can be helpful for just the individual who wants to self-examine their own behavior in certain areas and see if they want to grow and move away from them. So all of these things are great resources. Let's remember that with any addictive disorder, or any mental health disorder, right, it's not just a, an issue for the individual. This is an issue for the whole uh, family, workplace, community in some cases. Some of us have the some of us have the potential to damage national security in our gambling or gaming disorders, right? That's, we can influence the whole country. I love this, this slide and I use it both for my, for my gambling and gaming talks because you don't know who is the person with the problem in this slide, right? Is he angry with her because she spent $500 on Candy Crush this month? Is she ticked off at him because he spent all weekend playing Call of Duty with his friends when he promised they would go up to Mount Charleston for the weekend? Or are they upset with each other because they didn't know about the parental controls on the game that their six-year-old daughter was playing and she's run up six thousand dollars in credit card debt through the purchase she has made this that's a real story uh, by the way uh, they thought it was fraud and actually their child was was uh, running up thousands and thousands of dollars uh, so this this um, this is uh, important stuff. I, I added this on social media. We're going to have this test. I do this with all the kids because the feedback after one of my presentations I got from the teachers said after you left we we talked about this some more, and some of the kids said they don't really play games, but they worry about their own engagement with social media, how much time they spend on Facebook, things like this. So I want everybody to say as I put these icons up which social media platform this is. I do this with the kids, they're pretty good at it. Somebody got it pretty quick. This is the one that usually stumps the adults. It's like, what is that one? What is Twitch? So this is an online st streaming platform. Lots of people who like games engage, on it, engage in it. They are watching other people playing video games. And some people make, make some real money on this, get subscribers and the advertising associated with, get people just to send them money to buy loot box features in a game to see what they can get. There are some pretty famous examples that Cam uses. A lot of the parents stumble on that one. The kids get that almost universally. The kids stumble on LinkedIn when they see that. A couple of them will get that. It's like, what's that? It's LinkedIn. So the adults will get LinkedIn. The kids will get Twitch. But Twitch, online streaming platform where you can literally stream yourself live playing a game or make recordings of that. But people use it for other things than gaming. Right, cooking. You can live stream yourself cooking. Some people have cooking programs. You can do any activity. Some guy has a channel that he live streams himself eating. And I guess some people are you know, into that, watching other people eat. But virtually anything you can, you can think of there. So we talk about this and you know, what can I do as a student gamer to keep my gaming at a healthy level, occasionally view these, uh, review these quiz questions, talk with your parents about what daily limits should be and respect those boundaries. I always tell the kids, your parents will be so impressed if you come home today and say, yeah, I know you've, you've thought I game a little too much or I think I'm, I'm gaming a little too much and can we talk about you know, what, what do you think is the right, right thing? They'll, just, they'll be shocked. <laughs> Uh, talking, we talk about being sure to finish, finish schoolwork, chores, other obligations before you engage in gaming. Think of that as a, as a reward uh, for yourself. Um, don't use gaming as a means to escape from or avoid responsibilities, problems, or negative emotions, right? Talk with your parents, a trusted adult. What if I want to stop completely? You know, Cam has these ideas. Again, commit to quit gaming for 90 days as an experiment. Find at least three new non-gaming activities to help you achieve goals, relax at home, make new friends. What are you using that gaming for? And he's got a couple dozen of hobby ideas within each of those categories, depending on, depending on what you are using gaming for in your life as things outside of gaming that can fill that same purpose. 
Join an online support community like Game Quitters. Uh, Reddit has a Stop Gaming form, forum. There's also a, uh, a Computer Game, Gamers Anonymous uh, online, which is a 12-step group. And be patient. Take it one day at a time. What can I do as a parent? For those of you who are parents out there, start talking about this early, gaming and gambling. The research is really clear if we talk with our kids from an early age about drugs, sex, alcohol, gambling, gaming, they will be more likely to moderate their own risky behavior as they get older. And if you are someone in recovery and feel comfortable at some point sharing that with your child and helping them understand they're at higher risk just by virtue of them being your kid, that, that can help them as well. I've shared with my daughter from a very young age. Educate yourself and your children about potential risks of gaming, gambling, have, your, have that conversations about chatting with people online, determine together when's an appropriate time to be doing that. Learn about the parental controls. Know what behavior is normal. You're never gonna take the risk out of the teenager. The best you can do is moderate them. They're gonna to have to make some of those mistakes for themselves. Set those rules, do it collaboratively if possible. Monitor your children's activities, your own financial accounts carefully. Be involved in their life. Help your child develop those healthy coping skills. We, we wanna think of it less of controlling their behavior as an adult, right? Except when they're very small in some of these areas as uh, helping them become good self-regulators, right? Because good self-regulating kids become good self-regulating adults and boy, I sure did not have that when I was a kid. And then finally, consider how your own gaming and gambling behavior might be influencing your uh, children. These are some resources. They are all in, I'm not going to go into great detail, they are all in your uh, 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 presentation booklets. Intenta is the uh, group that offers the clinical training. It's 15 hours self-guided online. There is a discount code, REFERRAL10. That's also in your book. That's the discount from my having gone through this training uh, about two years ago when it first came out. Fantastic training that is updated constantly. When I went through it as one of the first ones, and I am not clinically trained, so I could not treat someone, but I did it from the prevention standpoint to learn about this, really. Uh, it is constant, the research is constantly updated. I was flabbergasted to go through this training and see some research cited that I knew had only been published a week before in the literature, right? It's that up to date and also the opportunities to, to work and develop case plans uh, for uh, uh, case studies. Uh, and you can get an international certification if that's what you're interested in, which is being offered actually through the International Gambling Counselor Certification Board. You can get that certification in gaming also. Um, if you're a research geek like me, youthgambling.com, um, Jeff Derevinsky's site can send you down tons of, of rabbit holes. It's wonderful. And therapy-wise, and by the way, I'm getting no kickbacks from any of these organizations. These recommendations are based only on personal experience or knowledge of the people involved in them. I think we'll hear about KindBridge a little later on. Insurance-based telehealth service specializing in game, gaming and gambling disorder specifically. Uh, Excellent. So finally, where, where are we headed? I promise to end with a little bit on, uh, on uh, eSports, uh, sports in general. Um, uh, we're experiencing, again, the largest expansion of legalized gambling in this nation's history. Lots of money being wagered on sports. Um, tons of concern uh, now about the relationship between major franchises, franchises and betting companies. You never used to be able to see odds or hear discussions by announcers of odds in a game. Now throughout the game, constantly watch a Major League Baseball team, it'll pop up on the screen. What are the odds this, the next guy up to bat is going to hit a home run? And what are those? How can you make that bet online? So you can stay in action constantly throughout, throughout the game. Um, these are the states that have legalized, this is as of a few weeks ago, all of the states in red have legalized sports wagering in the past three years. All of the pink ones are legal but not operational. All of the yellow ones um, have legislation pending this year. So I think in the next two years we probably will see 90 to 95 percent of the states have legalized sports wagering, which is one of the more problematic forms of gambling in terms of self-reported problematic behavior within, within gambling. And we've seen that double during the pandemic, by the way. Esports, real thing, competitive video gaming. It's been with us for a while, actually, but within the last decade, it has come into its own. The last League of Legends final competition had more viewership globally than the Super Bowl. 
over, over a billion viewers uh, of that. And the ability to wager on these games. Uh, and kids are often underage who are, of course, competing in these competitions. Here in Las Vegas, we have an eSports arena associated with the Luxor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my have Aaron uh, figure this out. It's just a 30-second video. If you're not aware of it, If you're 13 years old, you can go in unaccompanied, participate in some of these tournaments as long as the age rating uh, is appropriate. Uh, you, can, you can't play for um, the tournament prize money uh, unless you're at least 18 or accompanied by an 18-year-old. Notice I did not say parent or guardian, but if you are chaperoned by someone who is 18 or years or older, you can go in and participate uh, in these games and buy 24-hour passes and, and, uh, uh, and whoop it up. Um, this, is, this is just a map showing the high schools across the country that have esports teams, uh, competitive esports teams. This is Nevada. We've got a good cluster here in Clark County and also up around Reno, even in Wendover and Fallon. We have high schools now that have esports teams. This is one of my personal desires in the next year or so is to reach out to all of these high schools and see what kind of education their coaches and teams have about the issue of gaming disorder. You know, very important, just as with, with our physical sports teams, that they are getting uh, uh, both a good physical uh, health regime and mental health regime around these activities, right? By the way, that, that Liberty High School group, uh, I talked to about all of these things and, and, and uh, talked to them about considering what behaviors you're engaging in now that might jeopardize your future, uh, your future dream in this area. That team went on to win the state championship, beat Bishop Gorman along, along the way. I take full credit. It was my presentation that did that, bringing them together as a team to talk about these issues. Very, very cool. Uh, related topics that I'm not even, I don't have time to even touch on, uh, social casinos, the ability to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars online with no regulation and be assigned a host to con help you continue to stay engaged uh, uh, without the ability to ever actually recoup any of that money. Uh, cryptocurrency, how many of you watched the Super Bowl? Saw that there were like half a dozen advertisements for diff different cryptocurrency uh, firms and they were all targeting very young audiences. All of them were kind of like eight, that 18 to 29 year demographic that you see, which, which can be problematic in these areas. Non-fungible tokens, right? These mystery things, digital items, one of a kind digital items that can be bought and sold and traded for tremendous amounts of money and are making their way into the gaming and sports wagering world. Uh, world as well. Peer-to-peer -peer gaming wag wagering and simulations. These are all currently illegal, although there is a company that applied here in Nevada that wants to be the first to offer peer-to-peer -peer, uh, and was apparently granted a, a license. They haven't engaged in this yet, but this is the ability to, to set odds on your own games and have some peer out there say, yeah, I'll take that odds. Have a bet between individuals or kind of become your own bookmaker, right? With the company taking that VIG, just like the casinos do that 5% uh, off of the what's being wagered, but now you're wagering with with friends and family and unknown unknown people. And this already occurs illegally. It's very common. You can even wager on simulated sporting events. So you'll have a a, a game simulator simulate. You know a. Um, the uh, Denver Broncos versus the Las Vegas Raiders will have a simulated computer game. You can bet against a person on, and we'll see what the outcome is. Right, wild stuff. The metaverse it's coming I won't even go into that so um, a, a little bit of time for questions not much uh, about five but I apologize I do want to read just a couple notes these are from students that I spoke to just three weeks ago presented this for the first time at Las Vegas Academy a school that has had us back for eight years please read the poster board out front if you have not that that is from a series of just one presentation cycle I gave a number of years before the pandemic incredibly poignant and powerful powerful messages from the student. We have this one teacher who asks her students, just write a thank you letter to Mr. Hartwell. She did, that's the only instruction.
instruction. And what these kids write is really amazing. This is the first time I had presented this to this um, group. Thank you, Mr. Hartwell, for Thank you, Mr. Hartwell, for, for um, letting us know about addiction that isn't talked about often. I do have family and friends who have a gaming and gambling addiction. It def definitely reminded me of them. It inspired me to reach out to them. I appreciate the presentation again. Once again, thank you. A lot of times information which should be coming from parents and educators to the kids is going back now from the kids back to their parents and families. Um, thank you. I honestly thought this presentation was going to be about video game violence and quitting video games completely, which is something I disagree with. However, you ended up presenting a problem which I actually do agree with, and I've noticed a, a new problem, especially with modern games. It's honestly a problem that should stop since it's overshadowing the great games that were just made to be a nice piece of, of art. Overall, nice presentation addressed a real problem while not just putting up a huge agenda against all video games. Very important that we not stigmatize gaming. Thank you for this presentation, Mr. Hartwell. I play video games more than often and have been meaning to try and cut back on the amount of time I spend on them. This lecture was very helpful and I will definitely use the resources you provided in the future as well as educate my friends and family. Thank you. And finally, there's, um, there's one from almost every class that is something like this. Thank you for your talk today. Gambling and substance addiction has been a problem with people in my life, my whole life. I lost my father to it <clears throat> when I was a kid, and his gambling led to his cigarette and meth addiction, forced him to try and take his own life in front of me and my sister. So for me, this topic is serious and no joke. Thank you for spreading awareness. So really powerful stuff, and often we make these presentations to kids and just send it out there, wondering if it's having any impact and if they're thinking about it. But thanks to this one teacher who always has her kids just write a thank you note. We know that this is making a real difference in a lot of kids' lives and their families' lives as a result. So I'll stop now, and I've, I've used up almost all of my time, I, I recognize, but <laughs> catch me out there somewhere.